This is Damascus United Methodist Church in the 1930s, a country town 27 miles from bustling Washington, D.C. The church was on the corner of 124 and 108, which is now the Harwood Thrift Shop. Meanwhile, in a shop in Boston, Massachusetts, this organ was being built. It was constructed by an organ builder by the name of Ernest Skinner. Skinner was one of the most successful organ builders in the United States. When he was in his prime, uh, which was between 1922 and 1938, uh, he was the go-to organ builder because he was the finest organ builder around. It was akin to getting a Rolls Royce uh, instead of a Toyota. Uh, he was kind of like the Henry Ford of putting together organs on a production line where the console would be built in one room and all the pipes would be built in another room and they just combined it all up at the end. Every little uh, niche and corner of the uh, instrument was built by hand, um, usually by people who just did this over and over and over again, knew it uh, by, the, by heart. And they took a lot of pride in it and they made sure that when it went in, they would last for hundreds of years. Skinner had a unique way of making orchestral sounds come from the organ. At the time it was a new, uh, a new idea. Uh, Skinner was building stops that were imitated, imitative of orchestral instruments. It sounds like French horns and English horns, and like here we have a clarinet. Trumpet. We have an oboe. This is a string. Sometimes you'll hear something really big uh, during Sundays, and that's uh, tuba. It was basically the 1930s version of a computer. Instead of uh, microprocessors and electricity, it ran off compressed air and uh, movable wooden parts, uh, where that just wasn't being done on other organ builders. He really moved the technology of organs uh, forward decades before other organ manufacturers really caught on to that. And of course he patented it to protect it under the Skinner name so others couldn't reproduce it. In 1927, Ernest Skinner traveled to England and met a man named George Donald Harrison. Skinner and Harrison collaborated from 1928 to 1931 and created perfect harmony and during that time that was considered the prime of Skinner organ building uh, because Harrison brought the best of ideas from England uh, with Skinner's uh, uh, American school of organ building. They produced organs such as the uh, Woolsey Hall organ in Yale, which is one of the largest organs ever built. Woolsey Hall was Skinner's 722nd organ. In 1930, Skinner organ number 843 was built for Metropolitan Methodist Church in Washington, D.C. It was during this time that the relationship of Ernest Skinner and his protege Harrison hit a sour note. Skinner later figured out that uh, instead of being kind of a protege uh, to Skinner, Harrison was actually meant to be his replacement. Skinner felt betrayed and sold his shares in the company. Harrison paid Skinner money to use his name for Harrison's new company, Eolian Skinner. Ernest Skinner started another company with his son. And they went on to do Washington National Cathedral, which was his last great organ. For the next 13 years, Ernest Skinner's life had personal and professional setbacks. His way of building organs was being phased out. Then, in 1951, his wife Mabel passed away. Skinner went into a downward spiral and never recovered. So when he was in his prime, uh, he would go to conventions and he'd be revered almost as this organ deity. Uh, where you know everyone was going to him and asking his opinion on this and that and he was very blunt in giving his opinions. Uh, when his style more fell out of fashion, he was kind of almost a, a ignored uh, and left to his own little corner, the old man who you know never grew up in organ building, uh, to basically just sit there alone. In 1960, Metropolitan Methodist in Washington, D.C decided to replace their 30-year-old Skinner organ number 843 with an Aeolian. My father is Joseph A. Rice, Jr. He was a printer. He did a, printed a lot of bulletins for the different churches in town, and Metropolitan was one of them. Rice lived in Damascus and attended Damascus Methodist. 
The church was growing and a new church was being built across the street, so a brand new organ would be a crowning touch. They, this Metropolitan was a great big church and they were getting rid of this organ. They didn't want this organ anymore. It was old. They had the ad in the bulletin and he saw it and he said he wanted to buy it. There was just one problem. Joe Rice didn't have the money to buy the organ and neither did the church. He went and called Herb Hyatt, who was the president of the bank, of Damascus Bank. And Herb said, Joe, remember, we're just looking we aren't buying. And so about the middle of the afternoon, Joe called and said, Herb, I've just bought the most wonderful pipe organ that you can imagine. Herb said, you what? How are we gonna pay for it, Joe? He said, well, I thought maybe you would meet us next week at church when it's delivered and maybe you would bring your check to cover it. As usual, our people came through. They had a congregational meeting and people donated and pledged enough that they could get the full, a loan for the full amount. Okay, this is the organ chamber and we're gonna go ahead and look inside. Uh, we bought it for $7,500 and we had it installed for an additional $7,500. This is called a cathedral quality pipe because they build pipes of this scale uh, for actually mid to large cathedrals. And this organ was actually in a cathedral-esque space before they brought it to Damascus. To build this exact organ all over again would be upwards of a million dollars to $1.1 million. So these uh, ladders are the original 1961 ladders that they put in here. We really saved this organ by uh, almost rescuing it from, uh, from Alien Skinner and Metropolitan Memorial. The Alien Skinner organ company, uh, organ company's Mike Moeller, which was headquartered just in Hagerstown, uh, they would go around um, and they would just basically either tear out uh, Skinners and sell them for cheap, or they would just throw them into the fire and burn them. And really, uh, our Skinner here was a product of that had we not bought it. Uh, 843 denotes the uh, actual opus number that Skinner built. So this was his 843rd organ. And all this writing and everything is uh, the original 1930-31 writing that they would have done in the shop. So this is about 80 years old here. So we got it and then found out that we've got a treasure. The uh, Metropolitan Church would dearly love to have it back. It was something that no one had in Damascus. We were the first ones with an organ, a pipe organ. And then they brought all of these pipes into the sanctuary. Those pipes covered the entire floor, and the a builder that put the organ together somehow managed to fit all of those pipes into the organ chamber. It was a miracle. Organ number 843 was saved by Joe Rice, Herb Hyatt, and a church that cared. But after 51 years, this organ has repaid its debt. And I think I choked up the first time I heard it. I don't know, it was just, just something amazing. I remember a, an organist from a big Episcopal church in Baltimore came one time and he kept sitting here and he said, this is all you need, it's all here, this is all you need. <laughs> it can do so much, it can be very gentle, it can bring out every emotion, but I also like it when it gets loud. And I know there are people that say, oh, it gets too loud. It never gets too loud for me. Well, it's just a nice, nice asset and it can back up the, the hymns and the services. And the choir. It's just nice to have it. It 
was just the most magnificent feeling to come here early in the morning when it's so peaceful and so quiet and sit at that organ and learn how to play that magnific magnificent instrument. And I just hate to think that it is in disrepair, and I do hope that people will contribute and try to refurbish it. This is a 1930 version of a computer today. The problems that we're having with this organ right now is not really in terms of the sound. Uh, the sound is largely as Skinner and uh, Harrison would have left it. Uh, the problems we're having are like that computer, uh, 1930s version of a computer, is actually starting to break down now. So all the contacts are right here. The wires from each one of the uh, notes of the keyboard coming through these uh, uh, cotton wiring here. They touch the contact. Uh, when a note is pressed, that contact transfers a signal up to a uh, tube here that goes through there through a series of uh, valves and that valve goes out to the pipe chamber. These things have become so deteriorated that uh, they don't go down and actually touch the contacts anymore. So when you pull out a stop on the console, nothing plays because there's no electrical signals going through. So what we've had to do is basically we've had to put screws in here to basically jam those contacts shut uh, against the uh, wiring coming from the console. Uh, it fixes it for now, but uh, these contacts were never uh, designed to have constant 24-hour uh, pressure against them, and so they've already started to deteriorate where we've been losing stops on the organ because nothing is coming into contact with it. This has been tuned, retuned, and tuned back again so much that uh, when they were doing uh, fooling around with the organ in the 70s, uh, they adjusted the air pressure and they couldn't uh, get the pipe to tune high enough. And so what they did is they took shears and actually cut down into the pipe. You can see all the raggedy edges right here. And the shearing uh, really damages the pipe and the metal and everything, makes it uh, unstable. The seal that holds this uh, tube to this uh, chest has become so deteriorated that air is actually leaking out of it and causing a very high-pitched whistle that basically makes the organ unoperable. So what I've had to do is I've had to take this piece of paper and a spare program to actually wedge it into the uh, air gap in between here. Uh, I can't take it out and uh, show you the whistle because it took forever to get this in and right. But uh, this is actually holding the air seal of this uh, pipe against this chest. I really think in, in contrast to a piano or, or something else, the organ can uh, bring out so many different types of colors, such as uh, during a hymn like Amazing Grace, if you want the, you know, each verse to have its own little character, you can bring that out on an organ. On Amazing Grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me, that's more of a triumphant uh, uh, setting. So you would start out maybe with a, uh, a big sound with a trumpet. It's it's 80 years old, <laughs> and I'm 85, so <laughs> I'm sympathetic. <laughs>